Chairman Binswanger, members of the Board of Trustees, President Gozen, Dr. Bartlett, fellow faculty, family and friends of the graduates, and class of 2013. In a few moments, when you come forward and cross this stage, you'll be carrying with you your hopes and dreams, as well as those of the families who support you and the faculty who have vested so much in you. Your futures hold opportunities to provide compassionate care, discover cures, and educate the next generation of caregivers. What others will expect of you and what you will expect of yourselves the unreasonable, and the reasonable. Last month's horrific Boston Marathon bombing is still vivid in our minds. Transfixed by video loops of the explosions and their immediate aftermath, I found myself fixated on the runners themselves, one moment pressing forward on a beautiful New England spring day, the next a world ripped apart. Each runner reacted differently, a few stumbled. Some seemed to ignore the deafening explosions, unable or unwilling to flip the switch from finish line mode. Others registered the, change real the changed reality virtually instantaneously, with some even reincarnated into first responders. David King, a mass general trauma surgeon and veteran of Afghanistan, charged past the finish line and just kept tacking on miles beelining to his home hospital to receive the wounded. The spectrum of human response to catastrophe was on vivid display, and a few, like Dr. King, revealed a seemingly hardwired ability to internally recalibrate. This past year, we had an example of this much closer to home. Donald Liu, JMC class of 1990, Chief of Pediatric Surgery at University of Chicago Comer Children's Hospital, unwinding on a Sunday on a small Lake Michigan beach with his wife and three children. In the distance, he spots two 12-year-old boys toppled from their canoe by the lake's riptide current. In a flash, Dr. Liu flips into rescue mode, diving in to save them. Tragedy unfolds. He manages to help the boys make it to shore but is himself pulled down by the undertow, with his dramatic act of pure selflessness playing out before his family. Pediatric surgeons saving children, work life and personal life blurring together. Donald Liu's heroism touched the heart of so many, but none more than us here at Jefferson. After all, he was one of our children. A David King, a Donald Liu, Remarkable human beings, each displaying a superhuman ability to react to a suddenly shattered reality. Tempting for us in the Jefferson faculty to imagine we had something to do with this. Who knows? Intense clinical drilling, combined with incessant drumming of professionalism and empathy values, a magical potion for subliminal reprogramming that in a rare moment can transform one of our medical students into a heroic Liu capable of lightning reaction and self-sacrifice as a reflex. Yes, we are proud of our physician heroes. They instantiate our most profound aspirations. Yet, on reflection, there is a paradoxical dimension lurking behind their heroism. Might there be a slippery slope here between aspiration and expectation? As society demands ever more of its physicians, does the heroic self-sacrifice of a Donald Liu subliminally inflate society's expectations of its physicians? Are we all supposed to be godlike, ascending to some mythical standard of selflessness, doing incredible things, settling for nothing less than perfect? Last year, the question of professional expectations rocked the world of science. An Italian court convicted seven scientists and experts on manslaughter charges for failing to predict the 2009 6.3 magnitude earthquake in central Italy, which killed 300 people in the medieval town of L'Aquila and devastated its historic center. Six-year present sentences were handed down to the defendants, among them some of Italy's most prominent and internationally respected seismologists and, ge and geological experts. 
The accusation, quote, monumental negligence, for giving, quote, inexact, incomplete, and contradictory information, close quote, about whether small tremors felt by L'Aquila residents in the months before the quake should have cons constituted grounds for a quake warning. The conviction sent shockwaves through the international science community. The American Association for the Advancement of Science condemned the verdict as a complete misunderstanding of the science behind earthquakes, which are nearly impossible to predict and can only be forecasted with low probability. But the Italian courts saw it differently. The experts must be all-knowing and non-erring. Imperfection in professionals and experts will simply not be tolerated. In this new ethereal realm, reflected in that courtroom theater of the absurd, professionals must not only react to catastrophe, they are now expected to predict it. What is true in the court for geologists is also true in the court for physicians. Here in Philadelphia, we deliver health care in the backdrop of one of the nation's most unforgiving malpractice insurance court systems. Every delivery, every neurosurgical procedure must be perfect. Every heroic effort to save a patient at death's doorstep, even a patient whom others have abandoned as hopeless and Jefferson has embraced, is insidiously recast as a routine care encounter with no allowance for error. Through society's increasingly distorted lens, the heroic morphs into the expected. Nothing less than absolute perfection is tolerated. Needless to say, this has a chilling effect on how we practice medicine. Delivering a baby becomes an act of defiance, as does performing a brain operation to mitigate suffering. One almost becomes afraid to do anything. In his lyrical book, Intoxicated by My Illness, Anatoly Broyard waxes poetic about patients' expectations of their physicians. Quote, every patient invites the doctor to combine the role of the priest, the philosopher, the poet, the lover. He expects the doctor to evaluate his entire life like a biographer. But on a parallel track, I'd hasten to attack on some things that should not be expected. Heroism, omniscience, perfection. Yes, on rare occasions, such lofty qualities miraculously unfold before their eyes. The actions of the David Kings and Donald Views at defining moments commanding our admiration and awe. But this simply cannot be transformed into the normative. Expectations of physicians must be kept in check, confined to the realm of the reasonable. This slippery slope of aspiration to expectation extends to our research mission as well. Senators grill NIH leaders as to why more diseases have not been cured. Where is our nation's return on investment, they mock. Many politicians cultivate a perception of a disappointing lag in the translation of discovery into therapeutic application. Their view of the glass as half empty is ironic, given the astounding leap forward in biomedical sciences of the past decades. Unraveling the genome, designing whole new categories of personalized medicines and procedures, deciphering mechanisms of human pathophysiology that stretch the imagination. No matter, this triumph of biomedical discovery is discounted, impatience dominates, unrealistic directives are formulated, and bad policy ensues. Loss of faith in invention triggers a premature emphasis on technical implementation. An inexorable case for clinical translation, the catchword of the day, has gained lemming-like momentum with our scientific leaders themselves succumbing to the narrative and joining this bandwagon. Discovery, the very heart of the Academy's role in our society, has in some sectors become the villain as, as the plug is pro progressively pulled on extramural funding. Just when a doubling down of our biomedical investment is needed to capture the crescendo of biomedical insight. Ironically, as our nation barely reaches the finish line, other countries are racing forward, availing themselves of our multi-decade post-World War II investment into biomedical science. This is what happens when unrealistic expectations go unchallenged and false narratives are allowed to gain traction. So class of 2013, my first message, take the mantle of this fight. 
as you strive for perfection and aspire to elevate yourselves through a relentless focus on service quality and outcomes, you must at the same time resist, individually and collectively, the expectation for perfection and instant outcome. And as you pitch in to extend the limits of biomedical knowledge and pioneer new diagnostics and therapeutics, push back against those who throw darts and cynically question the rate of practical application. Do not tolerate unrealistic expectations from others and by no means impose them upon yourselves. As the saying goes, the perfect is the enemy of the good. It will interfere with bringing hope to the hopeless. It will impede scientific discovery just as we probe the boundaries of human knowledge. An Orwellian quote comes to mind. During times of universal deceit, telling the truth becomes a revolutionary act. Be revolutionaries. And another Orwellian quote. To see what is in front of one's nose needs a constant struggle. Too many refuse to look beyond their noses. A second message to you, class of 2013, moving from the unreasonable to the reasonable. What should you reasonably expect of yourselves? What is indeed reasonable when it comes to facing change? Well, you can't be expected to shine, let alone predict, when catastrophic change will befall. However, it is reasonable to challenge yourselves to recognize and adapt to gradual change. Real life change rarely has the drama of terrorist bombs or overturned canoes. More often than not, change is so gradual that one practically misses it entirely. Such change surrounds us in medicine, changes in disciplines and practice norms, changes in business of medicine models that constrain us. What each of you must continuously cultivate is what they call at Wharton peripheral vision, scanning for change that could be disruptive. You need to detect it, forecast it, and respond to it. Psychological flexibility will enhance your ability to perceive emergent realities in real time. In an ever-changing world, cultivate an agility for mental recalibration. Failure to assimilate changes that envelop you will ultimately derail you. I am fascinated by theories of the mind that speak to how we process reality and detect change. Both individually and collectively, we create our own realities and narratives. To wax poetic, our realities are, own, are our own self-enacted theaters. At the entrance to an exhibition of the art and videography of William Kentridge, a wall inscription describes the artist's conception of the world as a theater of memory. And in Soul Dust, a book on emerging notions of human consciousness, the author offers the intriguing metaphor of mind as theater. Our minds are synthetic and elastic, and within our personal theaters of the mind, we each set the expectations that dictate how we perceive and respond to changing rea realities. Simply put, we ourselves constrain or empower our responses to change. We calibrate that which is possible and that which can be reasonably expected. One last thought and third message to you, class of 2013. Moving from performance-related expectations to those surrounding your career goals. On this landmark day, it is certainly appropriate to think about how the theater of your mind frames your ambition. What do you dream of for yourselves? What are your threshold as well as fantasy career expectations? My advice, liberate yourselves from the onus of perfection. Allow yourself satisfaction in incremental accomplishments and importantly, allow for intermittent setbacks and failures along the way. The 19th century Greek poet Constantine Cavafy reflects in his poem, The First Step, on the challenge of realizing one's professional ambitions and dreams. Cavafy writes, just to be on the first step should make you happy and proud. Even this first step is a long way above the ordinary world. To have come this far is no small achievement. What you have done already is a glorious thing. So class of 2013, set your career goals high, but do not demand the unrealistic. Today, as you take stock of yourself, sitting here in majestic graduation regalia, if there's a haunting feeling deep down that notwithstanding it all, you haven't quite gotten to where you could be, temper this feeling. 
There is no world standard scale for measuring career accomplishment. You set your own scale. It too is enacted in the theater of your minds. This unsettled feeling is a natural for many of us overachievers, but understand that it will deflate you and even dissuade you from taking the first steps. You are better off internalizing Cavafy's wisdom. Even this first step is a long way above the ordinary world. Knowing the value of first steps should motivate you to seek out and embrace them fearlessly, aggressively, but realistically. In an ever-changing world, fear of failure framed by over-expectation can be crippling. A few moments ago, you heard from our honorary degree recipient, a pioneer himself of ECMO, on this 60th anniversary year of its progenitor technology, Jefferson's heart-lung machine. A few weeks ago, Herb Cohn, one of our distinguished sur senior surgeons, shared an insider's view of the development of the heart-lung machine. It turns out that the machine's pioneer, John H. Gibbon, the surgical giant, had a deep-seated fear of failing his patients. In the year after his 1953 landmark operation, Gibbon performed two additional cases with a heart-lung machine. Both patients died. He responded by closing the heart-lung program for a year, and when the shop reopened, he turned it over to John Templeton. From that day on, Gibbon, though only 50 years of age, never did another heart operation, confining himself to his thoracic surgical practice. Ironically, the patient's deaths had nothing to do with the heart-lung machine per se, but rather with the simple fact that these patients, unlike the first, were undergoing a far more tre treacherous procedure, pul pulmonary embolectomy via the Trendelenburg procedure, one unavoidably associated with dismal survival. No matter, Gibbon abandoned the heart-lung machine, notwithstanding his 27-year experimental quest and his 1953 surgical triumph. A fear of failure can lead even giants to abandon their craft in their prime. Fortunately, Gibbon had already made it to the first step. When questioned about the collapse of her assistance enterprise in Africa in the wake of the Yom Kippur War, Prime Minister Golda Meir smartly retorted, a setback is not a failure, a disappointment is not a ruin, a frustration is not a catastrophe. Not every enterprise can give immediate returns. Nothing ever goes to waste, time will tell. So in closing, class of 2013, my message is to you. Number one, while celebrating the extraordinary among yourselves, do not think it is the expected. Aspire for that which is realistically attainable and diligently recalibrate your mindsets from the unrealistic to the real. Remember, you write the script for the theater of your mind. Two, Yes, aspire for the most, but do not let others turn that aspiration into an expectation. Reach out to resist the unreasonable when it is being forced upon you, and do not tire of telling your story or in demanding that of others have real and demanding that others have realistic views of us. And three, and last, what you should expect of yourselves is meaningful first steps, defining first steps that are attainable for you derive satisfaction from their attainment, understanding that even at your best, you can't accomplish it all at once. Even the first step will be worth it. As you now take the sacred oath of Hippocrates, hear the profession's ancient call to service, heed its admonitions, and affirm your commitment to others in the most professional and altruistic ways. And permit yourselves to look at yourselves realistically and know that first steps, reasonably framed, can make a real difference. We salute all those that brought you to this point in life, your parents and family, who nurtured and supported your passion for service and inquiry. As you cross this stage, it is indeed the dreams of all of us here today that go with you. You enter a long tradition that dates from Hippocrates to McClellan and Gross, through Gibbon, and now to you. It is your turn to join, to continue, and to enhance Jefferson's legacy of service, and to perpetuate that desire to make a difference that brought you to Jefferson four years ago. Will the candidates for the degree of Doctor of Medicine please rise?